I want to begin with a little item here that will get us thinking along the lines I want us to think about. No one imagined that Charles Dutton would have achieved anything, for he spent many years in prison for manslaughter. But when someone asked this now successful Broadway star of the piano lesson how he managed to make such a remarkable transition, he replied, unlike the other prisoners, I never decorated my cell. He had resolve to never regard his cell as home. Yes, he knew he was going to be there so long a time, but he never decorated it as home because it wasn't home to him. Well, Christians, we have a lot to accomplish in this world, and we can, but we need to long for a better country, like the Hebrew writer says, a heavenly one. So our focus this morning is going to be on where is your citizenship? And it comes, of course, from the last few verses of Philippians chapter 3 that we've been studying for the past several weeks. And I certainly hope you have your Bibles. You need them this morning. And we're going to be reading from Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 17 and going through chapter 4, verse 1. That's going to be our text this morning. Philippians 3, verse 17 and following. And we're going to notice three things. Looking out, looking up, and looking forward. Verse 17, Brethren, join in following my example. And note those who so walk, as you have us for a pattern, for many walk, of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So point number one, look out for certain people. Looking out for certain people. First of all, we're to look out for those people who are following Paul's example. Look for people who are imitating Christ. Here the readers are urged to join with others in following the apostle, but only as he imitated Christ. Like he told the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, imitate me even as I also imitate Christ. Paul said, look for people, look for Christians who you can follow as an example. Paul said, when I'm following Christ, look at me. But look at others, too. Look for people who are following Christ. Fix your eyes on them. Whether you're a new Christian, whether uh, you've been a Christian for many years, look for people you can fix your eyes on. There are people out there, there are Christians out there to whom you need to imitate their lives. That's what he's telling them. Carefully observe how they talk where they go, how they act, how they interact, how they react to people, their whole manner of life. He says if you do this, you'll have a pattern to follow. And it's so important to do that. Think about this though. <clears throat> when people are learning a sport, do the coaches just give them a book and say, good luck? No, they don't do that. They show them by example. Depending on their age, they'll show, this is how you hold uh, a basketball. This is how you hold a bat. This is how you throw a football. This is how you do these things. This is how you kick a soccer ball. So th these younger people, these people who haven't played, watch those who have done it. 
I mean, I, I remember vividly when I was in junior high. Some people called it the Stone Age. That's not what I called it. It's when I was in junior high. My favorite basketball player was Jerry West of the Los Angeles Lakers. So that tells you how long ago it was. And I tried to imitate his jump shot because I thought he had the most perfect jump shot. Of course, I never obviously got anywhere to his level, but I had someone that I could watch. And every time the Los Angeles Lakers was on TV, I could watch and see how he shot. And that's how I learned. I got pretty good. <laughs> because I was watching and imitating. Paul says this is what you need to do to Christians. You need to watch and imitate. See how that person talked. Maybe somebody was, was being real ugly and rude to them, but the Christian was not getting upset, not getting angry, not saying things they, they shouldn't say. So you can watch and imitate them. We have responsibility. Uh, those of us that's been Christians for a while, we have a, a responsibility to be examples. Listen to what Paul told Titus. Titus chapter 2. Turn with me there to the very beginning of Titus chapter 2, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Titus chapter 2. <clears throat> we'll begin in verse 1. And think about this as, as uh, people to imitate, to follow. Titus 2 verse 1 says, But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men, right, these are people who are uh, spiritually mature in Christ, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. The older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded, in all things showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. So there we have young men, young women, women older men, older women, all with responsibility. All with responsibility. So Paul is saying, you learn by watching others. Just like you do with anything, you watch others and see See how they live and act and talk and behave and react. But then in verses 18 and 19, he says there are people to watch out for that you don't want to imitate. So there's this first group. He says watch them and, and imitate them, but this other group don't imitate anything about them. He calls them the enemies of the cross of Christ. So Paul's contrasting two totally different groups of people. Those who are friends of Jesus by how they live and those who are his enemies. In other words, they hate, they oppose Christ's teachings. And Paul, some of these people no doubt were at one time faithful Christians, but they left the faith. And Paul apparently knows some of them personally, or at least it's, he seems to. So he, he would have to be very sad, but he comes to the point. He was not tolerant of them at all. In other words, he wasn't, to use a term today, ecumenical in any way. You know, unfortunately, many people in the Lord's church today endorse anything or anyone that claims to be Christian. Well, we can't do that. We cannot do that. And it grieved Paul here to see what these men were doing. And so he describes them in four ways. He says, or he says four things about them. Number one, their end is destruction. Their fate, if they continued in that pattern, their fate was eternal separation from God in Gehenna, in hell. 
That was their eternal destiny. And what made it even worse was some might follow them and end up being lost too. So Paul says you, you look out for this group who, who's following Christ and then you have to look out for the other group who are enemies of Christ. Do not follow them in any way. They are enemies. And he said their God is their belly. They just do what pleases them. They're just concerned about their own desires. That's all. That's all they're concerned with, meeting their needs. And some people just go to church for that reason. They just have some needs they think they have, and they don't go for worshiping God or anything. They just go to have those needs met. It says that's what these people are like. They're enemies of Christ. He's there, he says their glory is in their shame. What these enemies were doing was actually shameful. It was actually shameful. Many today boast that they're so loving they would accept into fellowship anybody. Paul says you can't do that. Paul says there are people who are enemies of the cross of Christ. There are people who are friends and there are people who are enemies. We don't and cannot tolerate sin, Paul said. What these people were calling glory was actually shame. And he says, they set their mind on earthly things. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. But that's just the opposite of what our attitude should be. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 3, and notice what the first two verses say. Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> God is telling the church at Colossae something. This is what he says. If then you were raised with Christ, you've came up out of the waters of baptism, a new creature, you're raised. Seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Not on things on the earth. So he says we need to watch and look out for people who are walking after the Spirit and not walking after the flesh. People who are walking after the flesh can lead us astray. When we see people who are doing something we know the Bible says is wrong, we may like them, they may be friends, they may be family, they may be our heroes on TV. Paul says, don't imitate them. Don't imitate them. So looking out. Then he says, looking up, verse 20, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul contrasts faithful Christians with the enemies of Christ. He says the latter belong to an earthly kingdom. But Christians belong to a heavenly kingdom. Now remember at this time Philippi was a very special city in the first century because it was a Roman colony and as a result enjoyed Roman benefits from being a Roman colony. Most cities were not. So Philippi was a very special city. So the Christians in Philippi would know what Paul is talking about. Paul says our citizenship is not in Rome. Nor do we look for anything coming from Rome. We don't look for uh, the, the emperor to come from Rome. We don't look for anybody to come from Rome. He says our citizenship is in heaven. It is not in this world. The Bible says this world is truly not our home. We are citizens of heaven. As a result, just like these people would have known what it meant to be Roman citizens, heavenly citizens have benefits. Turn with me a few pages back in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. 
Notice what God tells us <clears throat> in verse 19. Ephesians 2.19 has so much to do with what we're talking about. Ephesians 2.19 says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. We are not strangers and foreigners when we become Christians. We have a whole new group, a whole new citizenship. We live here temporarily. We live here temporarily. Remember Abraham when the writer in Hebrews talking about Abraham? Abraham looked for a heavenly country, a heavenly city, because he knew this wasn't our world. This wasn't where he was from. He was going back to his homeland. If our citizenship is truly in heaven, then this world should feel alien. We should never feel like this is where I belong. You don't belong here. If you're a Christian, you don't belong in this world. This is an alien world to us. We should never feel at home here at all because it is not. Going one more time back to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6. <clears throat> Paul says in talking about Christians what we have been given and what's been done to us. Verse 6 says, and raised us up together. There's the raising again that we talked about. And made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Not earthly places, heavenly places. We should feel like we're a different ethnic group living in a foreign city. So that's how we should feel. The church here in Granby should have a special identity, a unique identity. So when people uh, know that we're from the Church of Christ in Granby, they know we are unique because we don't live here. This isn't our home. It's not meant to be our home. Our citizenship is in heaven. We own some land in heaven. That's where we're going to. That's where we'll feel at home. And we'll never feel at home, or we shouldn't, until we get to heaven, because that's our home. That's what Paul is saying. And because that's our home, we're always doing what? Like he says, looking to heaven where we're eagerly waiting for the Savior, because that's where he's coming back. Remember when Jesus ascended in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11? Remember there's two angels there and the apostles are there and they see Jesus go up in a cloud and what do the angels say? You know, don't, don't be amazed, don't marvel because the same way he left, that's the way he's coming back. Coming back from heaven. Paul also mentions this in his Thessalonian letter. Now Jesus is going to return. And we're going to be caught up together with him in the clouds. We're eagerly anticipating his return. We're looking forward to it. We hope it's soon. Because this isn't where I belong. I want to go be where I belong. Because that's the best place. But he ends this section by saying something has to happen first. And we have to look forward to our bodies being transformed so they can go to heaven. Because these bodies can't go to heaven. This body I'm in right now can't go to heaven. The Bible says it's corruptible, it's decaying, it's growing old. So this body, something must be done to it. And Paul says in verse 21, Jesus is going to transform our lowly body, this this body of, of humiliation. It's a humble body. It's not a heavenly body. That it may be conformed to his glorious body. Did you get that? 
Your body and my body is going to be like Jesus' body. That's what he says. And this is going to happen according to the working by which Jesus is able even to subdue all things to himself. So at the end of time, when Jesus returns, he's going to transform our lowly body. And he's going to make it a perfect body, and it's going to be perfect in the sense it's going to be able to live in heaven. And it's going to be like his. John says the same thing in 1 John chapter 3. The first three verses of that, John says that's going to happen. 1 John chapter 3, and it's the first three verses. 1 John 3, verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> John says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not owe him. See, we're, we're not known in this world. This isn't where we're from. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he's revealed, when he comes back, when he returns, just like he was talking about in Philippians. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. A glorified body. That great chapter on the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul goes over many times talking about how there's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. There's a corruptible body, there's an incorruptible body. There's an earthly body, there's a heavenly body. This body has to be changed. You know, Jesus said in the Gospel of John that the day is coming when all who are in the graves, and think about the billions of people, all who are in the graves are going to hear his voice and come forth. Every last one. and their bodies will be transformed. And Jesus says, some will go into everlasting life, some into everlasting condemnation. But their bodies will be transformed. And it's going to be done because Christ has the power to do it. Science can't do it. Science can't keep our bodies alive forever. God made that a fact in the Garden of Eden. So as much as we try to prolong life, God's the one who has control. He's the one that made these bodies temporary. And regardless of what we do, we cannot make them live forever. And as Christians, we wouldn't want that. We don't belong here. I don't belong in this body anymore. I want the new body. I want the glorified body, the one that can live in heaven forever. And we should look forward to that, like he says. Look forward to that. And so he ends by saying, Therefore, my beloved and long for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord beloved. Chapter 4, verse 1. Stand fast. So in view of the resurrection, in, in view of the, of the transformation of our bodies, in view of Christ's return, he says, stand fast in the Lord. Stand fast. Continue to have strong convictions. <coughs> We're living in what historians are calling the post-Christian world. It's not a Christian world that we live in anymore. When I was growing up, Even people that were atheists didn't care if I was a Christian or not. They didn't care if Christians were Christians. That was fine. But that has changed. Now those same people hate Christians and hate Christianity and hate the church and do not want Christians living their faith in the public domain, the public square as it's called. 
But just like we read in Titus 2, we have examples to set. And that's for everyone. We must set those examples. Our faith is to never be private. It's to be public. Doesn't make any difference if the world wants us to keep our faith private. The world doesn't dictate to us what we should or shouldn't do. Only God above does that. And he says we have to go into all the world. And that's everywhere. So we take our faith into the world, whether the world wants it or not. That's what we must do. And that's why Paul says, stand fast in the Lord. <coughs> Have those strong convictions. Where is your citizenship? Have you been raised up from the waters of baptism to become a new citizen? Do you long for Christ's return? Do you look forward to that glorified body? The very end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, verse 20, what does it tell us? Come, Lord Jesus. That's what we look forward to. Come, Lord Jesus. So this morning, I'm asking you to come if you're ready to answer that gospel call. Let us stand and sing this invitation song. <laughs>